Hello, P Street people, whoever else might be joining us. This is part two of a series of lessons entitled, a three-part series entitled, The Full Armor of God. Um, Paul, in Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 18, discusses the armor of God, the armor that God has provided us with. And last week, we, after, you know, an introduction of sorts and kind of getting our minds wrapped around the language, we discussed the first two pieces of God's panoply. Panoply comes from the Greek word panoplion, which is translated either full armor or whole armor in our standard translations. We looked at the belt of truth. That would be the knowledge of the, the conviction of the truth that defends us against the enemy's lies. More of a de- defensive posture there. And then, we, um, and then we talked about the breastplate of righteousness. And this is living a life in accordance with the truth. This is about doing what we should, refraining from what we shouldn't do. And we were challenged to discern whether we might have some chinks in our armor. And we can do the same tonight as well when we look at the next two um, pieces of God's armor that he does want each and every Christian to equip himself or herself with. Um, Before we look at the next two pieces of armor, uh, I want us to consider a passage in 2 Corinthians. We'll just take a little time here to explore some other passages that use warfare imagery. Uh, it's not that they are necessarily tied to this passage in Ephesians 6, but it just goes to show us that we're at war. This passage is interesting. It's in 2 Corinthians 10, verses 3 through 5. Here's a Here is a portion of the paragraph uh, that began in verse 1. Paul writes, For though we walk in the flesh, we are not waging war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not of the flesh, but have divine power to destroy strongholds. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. In context, Paul is apparently dealing with some opponents at Corinth. There were folks who were calling into question his apostleship. Uh, There were folks, believe it or not, calling into question his dedication to the truth. And here Paul uses war imagery. Um to describe what his weaponry, his spiritual weaponry, is capable of. Some people were claiming that, you know, when Paul is away, he's very bold and confident, but when he is present, he is humble and and meek or maybe of no account or something like that. And so here, um, Paul uses... Uh, some pretty vivid imagery the 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 idea of the stronghold i mean in in um you know ancient civilization you would have you know sort of classic warfare you would have your you know city would would build a wall around it a stout wall for security but even within that wall there would be what's called a stronghold that could be defended by you know, minimal soldiers. And once you take the stronghold, you've effectively taken the city. And Paul claims that his weapons have divine power to destroy or to demolish strongholds. And then I think he goes on to give us an idea of exactly what he is, uh, what he's talking about. He's talking about certain certain arguments that folks might make against the truth of God, or maybe perhaps the expectations of God. And it's when it's when Paul says he has these weapons to demolish these strongholds or to demolish or destroy these arguments, he's not saying that he can just 
out debate someone that it's his tactic uh and they can drive them shamefaced from the stage I, I think he's saying a little more than that he's saying that his weapons destroy the way people think um demolish their sinful thought patterns uh, the the mental structures uh, by which they live their lives in rebellion to god I mean, so so many people have erected pretensions to shut out the knowledge of God. Maybe they claim intellectual doubt, or they appeal to arguments of philosophy and skepticism, or they display a condescending cynicism, or they merely remain aloof and distant, claiming intellectual independence that loves to debate theology ad nauseum, but never bow the knee in adoring worship. And such arguments and pretensions are what Paul's spiritual weaponry has the power to demolish. And then Paul's weapons not only destroy arguments, they're also powerful enough to take every thought captive to Christ, and that is uh, to obey Christ. That's what he says there the very end of this this little section here and the picture is of a military expedition into enemy territory and it's an expedition that is so effective that the plan of the enemy is thwarted every scheme is foiled every counteroffensive is beaten what's more these designs and schemes of sinful men are captured by Christ and they're brought under a new authority. Using his spiritual weapons, Paul takes captive every scheme and every thought or every mind and makes it obedient to Christ. And the interesting thing is, is that in just in what we read, he doesn't, he doesn't really discuss what those weapons are. We could deduce some from uh, the Second Corinthians 10 and 11. Uh, and then I do think we get maybe an idea of some of the things Paul has in mind in Ephesians chapter 6. But I wanted to show you just another passage, just to briefly explore another passage that uses warfare imagery. And uh, because there are several, and we'll have a chance to look at, look at another one next week. You know, besides what we find in Ephesians chapter 6. So now we're ready to, to go back and consider the, the weapons or the armor that Paul discusses in Ephesians chapter 6. And here's a little slide that kind of, um, I guess, summarizes what Paul's, you know, highlighting here in our passage in Ephesians 6. We looked again, as I said, belt of truth. And breastplate of righteousness. Last week, this week we want to look at what I'm going to call the shoes of preparedness and the shield of faith. We'll look at the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit next week, along with what I have, you know, outlining this prayer. You know, it's it's kind of prayer is something that we are to continue to do, as Paul says, besides just wearing this spiritual armor. So let's look at the, the shoes of preparedness. And here I have three different versions. And notice, and I'll just, just look at these with me. The NKJV has, And having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. The NASB, And having strapped on your feet the preparation of the gospel of peace. And the ESV is a little more interpretive. Look, it says, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Um, this piece of armor, uh, this piece of God's panoply is, is one that uh, perhaps is a little more debated than some of the others as to exactly what Paul had in mind here. And the NKJV and the NASB 
stay pretty close to the original. Uh, they're just talking about, you know, um, equipping your feet. The word shoes per se doesn't appear, but that's what it's getting at. And that's what Paul is referring to. And the ESV makes that, makes that pretty clear here, uh, clearer than maybe the others. Uh, and this, you know, to just look at the, the shoe itself, the imagery that Paul is using. Uh, the Roman soldier wore a low half boot. It would have had a strong sole and then would have had open leather work above it. It was studded with sharp nails to ensure a firm grip. Uh, and it was designed for mobility and not just, not just protection. And then we have the question, well, what exactly is the spiritual application of this? The preparation of the gospel of peace is how the NKJV and the NSB have it. Then you've got a readiness given by the gospel of peace. And generally, you will find that scholars and writers come down on maybe one of two places. Most, I think have, or I shouldn't say I think, most consider this defensive. However, some do highlight the offensive side of, uh, of this imagery. Uh, so let's look at each of those. I do think perhaps the defensive application here is, is probably the primary, we should say. But there are reasons why some people just can't let go of the offensive side of this. All right. So on the, on the defensive side, you could say that knowledge of and dependence on the gospel that gives us peace is necessary if we are to have a firm foothold in the conflict. You know, since, as we looked last week, since the Christian warrior is to stand, four times some form of stand is used, is to stand, then he must have a firm foothold. He must have no uncertain, unprotected foothold. And preparedness or readiness is the thought here. Without the boots, he's merely relaxing. With them, he is ready for combat. And there is, of course, a paradox here. The paradox here is we're, we're in the midst of a war, but reference is being made to the gospel of peace. It's, it's kind of beautiful. It's, it's kind of ironic. It's, 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 it's to say that the gospel of peace readies us for war, you know. And... Um, and there, yeah, it's kind of paradoxical, and there's some irony to it. But the the defensive idea is that in this conflict, I must have a firm footing in the good news of peace, the good news of reconciliation. That I must understand it. I must understand how I'm justified. You know how what Christ has done for me that I, I fully appreciate all of that, and that puts me in a place to withstand whatever the enemy might throw at me. So it's kind of easy to see the defensive, like we're digging in, we're getting ready to hold our place, okay, to withstand what's coming. And we do that by the preparation readiness given to us by the gospel of peace. Others like to take a more offensive look here. Uh, there is the passage in Romans chapter 10, and... Perhaps I should have opened up to that already, but I haven't. But I got to it pretty quick. So in Romans 10, verse 15, it says, And how are they to preach unless they are sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. So not a few people have that in their mind. And they're like, well, maybe this readiness or this preparedness is not just you know, a defensive posture. Maybe it's a good, you know, a good defense is a good offense, right? And, and so um, we, we have to be prepared to share the gospel of peace or to share the gospel of reconciliation with the world. 
um, as if we're going to go in and raid Satan's POW camp, right? And we're going to bring more people to our side by our sharing this gospel, by, you know, mobilizing and to, to conquer or to win souls for Christ. Um, you know, it, it, the, I mean, that's true, right? That, that, is, that is true that we are to be about that, that that's sort of our, if we may say this, that is our marching orders as the church. As to whether that offensive idea is what Paul had in mind with the shoes, that's probably debatable. But it is still a point worth making. And we ought to, again, remind ourselves that it's not just preachers and teachers that are supposed to be sharing this good news or taking this good news. We all have, we all have a responsibility uh, to, to be people who prize and, may I use the word, perform evangelism. So, shoes of preparedness. You got your shoes on, right? What condition are your shoes? How, how appreciative, how knowledgeable are you of the gospel of peace? How thankful are you for it? Um, it, is, it is good news. It's the greatest news the world's ever heard. And that's what's going to, by having a strong foothold, a firm footing in that, we'll be able to withstand whatever comes our way. And then we get to the shield of faith. Now, admittedly, this shield here, the picture I've got, is probably not the best picture. Um, that shield kind of looks more like a shield from the Crusades, uh, something like that. Um, in point of fact, the word that Paul uses here for shield is closely related to the Greek word for door. So, thyreon is the word for shield, thyra is the word for door. And the reason why I'm making that connection is because while some armies would use like a small round shield, the Romans were famous for using a shield that was about you know, about as wide as a man's body and was up to four feet in length. And maybe you've seen some movies where, you know, they they have these long, you know, these long shields that they can all kind of stack together and create almost like a, a turtle shell, right? Whenever there's a barrage of arrows or something of that nature. But this was a shield that might have had like a wooden frame. It would have been rectangular, not so much like this. And it might have had a lot of uh, ox hide, you know, layers of it on the front. And interestingly enough, they would drench that ox hide in water because, you know, a sort of a favorite weapon among the Israelites, the, the Romans, the Greeks, all of that, you know, was the fiery arrow. You know, you'd have some, um, like a clump of fiber attached to the front of the arrow that you would, you know, light up, shoot it. And, you know, you'd have these, um, have these shields that could literally quench those darts, uh, whenever they hit the oxide that was, or had been drenched in water. And so using that imagery, right. Paul says that we got to take up the shield of faith that's able to quench the fiery darts of the devil. Now, what, what, what is the faith here? Okay, this kind of comes back to, you know, kind of like we had to do with truth, right? A faith can often be used in a couple of big senses in Scripture. There's the faith, like, the content of the the truth you know it's basically indistinguishable from the truth it's the it's the content uh in that again in that objective sense but then there's that faith and i think that's more what's in view here 
is that personal faith, that personal trust that we have in our God. That you know, which obviously it's our commitment to Him, it's our trust in Him. Um, it's the fact that we can depend on Him, and based on our complete trust in God. We are able to deal, right, and to defend ourselves against whatever arrow Satan might hurl at us. And, of course, folks have had some fun. Well, what exactly are these arrows that Satan shoots at us? We know it's not, again, we're not in a, the midst of some physical earthly war. We're in a spiritual war. So maybe these arrows can be arrows of doubt, arrows of discouragement, right uh er, arrows of um you know the insults that we get from the world the uh the slander from the world uh, da- uh, arrows of fear um anything that satan might use to kill our faith uh to to upend us and just as we've got to have a firm footing in the gospel of peace, the gospel of Jesus Christ, we have got to don the shield of faith, which I do think represents our trust and commitment to God. Because we understand that the enemy is not going to let us get away without subtle attacks and more open assaults, faith is the shield that counters those blows. And Satan Satan would love nothing more than for us to just throw down our shields and head for the hills. But we've got to hold on to our faith. We've got to have a death grip on our faith. And in doing so, we can have utter confidence, right? That faith is giving us utter confidence. It means, right? I mean, points to this utter confidence that God is going to provide for us and he is going to protect us, uh, at least spiritually speaking, right? So the shield of faith, the shoes of preparedness. Uh, As we close, I want to, I guess, remind us something that, you know, as Christians, this, this victory is is assured each and every one of us. In the book of Revelation, now that's full of some war imagery, right? I mean, there is warfare visions all over the place in there. And it's a book that reminds us that you're on the winning side if you are on Christ's side. The victory is ours, but we are told again and again not to lose heart. And so, how are you doing? You know, have you you retired on your pension before the war is resolved? Have you decided perhaps to go AWOL? Um, how, How are you holding up in this war? Do you fit Matthew Arnold's description of slovenly discipleship in his poem the scholar gypsy here's what he writes light half believers of our casual creeds who never deeply felt nor clearly willed whose insight never is born fruit in deeds whose vague resolves have never been fulfilled for whom each year we see breeds new beginnings disappointments new who hesitate and falter life away and lose tomorrow the ground won today. There is no inactive reserve in the Lord's army. You're either in or you're out. You're either in the fight or you're not in the fight at all. And so we're, I guess here at the end, Just this is just a... Um, I guess a push in the back to us all to make sure that we remain committed to the gospel, uh, 
that we maintain our faith in Christ, that we bear up under whatever attack comes our way because we have, in fact, been assured the victory. Hey, thanks for, for joining uh, me tonight, um, watching this video. Uh, and then we will uh, we'll get back at it next Sunday night for part three of the full armor of God. We'll look at the last two pieces of armor, and then we will uh, we'll think a little bit about what Paul ends with, and that is prayer. All right. Hey, thanks for thanks for watching.